God in our lives and try and make the kinds of decisions that cooperate with what the Holy Spirit is up to within us. <clears throat> You've heard me say many times that if we hear a spiritual prompting and ignore it, then the next one is harder to hear, right? And so that cultivation of God speaking in our lives, those little nudges that we can choose to ignore or honor, and those ways that we allow God to lead and guide and direct us. Now, if only we could have you know, a burning bush every time we had a, an important question on our minds, right? How many times have we longed for a, a Moses-like moment or that moment of clarity where God just speaks directly and audibly into our lives, but that's not generally what happens to most people. For most of us, spiritual maturity is a matter of practice. It is a matter of being in the holy habits that help us to become more and more mature. We heard read this morning one of my very favorite gospel stories. It's the story of the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. And <clears throat> it says in the scripture that Jesus had to go that way in order to get where he was going in Galilee. Now, to say that Jesus had to go that way is not exactly geographically the case because there was a well-worn path for Jews to take who needed to travel in that general direction in order to completely avoid Samaria because if they went through Samaria, they had a high risk of becoming ritually unclean. Now, so there was this, this path along the Jerusalem River. It was a little bit longer than going straight through Samaria, but nevertheless, it was commonly traveled. And so Jesus chose not to take that path. He chose to go through Samaria, the most direct route, but certainly not the only available route to him. Now, Samaria used to be the northern kingdom of Israel, and what was known as uh, the, the southern kingdom, five and 600 years before, was the uh, modern day Israel, or ancient Near East day, when Jesus was walking, Israel, that the Jewish people knew. So when King David and King Solomon had reigned, the kingdom comprised both the northern and southern. But by the time Jesus was in the picture, it was just the southern kingdom that was entirely Jewish. The northern kingdom had become known as Samaria. And that is because they had been conquered not by the Babylonians as the southern kingdom had, but by the Assyrians. So about 600 years before Jesus, the Assyrians had conquered the northern kingdom. And the thing about the Assyrians is they really believed that if you wanted to control those people that you had conquered well, you needed to mix their religion together with the practices of the Assyrians. And so Samaria had become this mixture of Judaism and other things. And you know, we reserve a, a special kind of uh, deep anger toward people who we believe used to be right just like us, and then chose the wrong path, right? Uh, and so there was this, this special you know, level of disdain by Jewish people for people in Samaria. So much so that if you were to eat or drink anything in Samaria, you were considered unclean. The southern kingdom, when it had been conquered, uh, had, the, had the opportunity to maintain its orthodox practices because the Babylonians, about 500 years before Jesus, were the ones who finally conquered the southern kingdom. And so they had maintained their Jewish practices throughout history. And in fact, there are still modern day Sumerians. Uh, if, you, if you want to find them, I saw one interviewed on PBS a couple of years ago. Uh, and so <clears throat> Jesus chooses to go through Samaria. So clearly this is a theological have to, right? He has to go through because he has to make the point theologically that he is making. And his point is that this news that he brings, this salvation that he brings, is not just for the Jews. It's even for the people that the Jews have a special dislike for. It's even for the Samaritans. And so he comes to Jacob's well, and there he meets a woman, 
And he asks her for a drink of water. A drink of water. Now, one, she's a woman. In that time, men did not speak to women who were not their wives out in public. Two, she's a Samaritan, so she's doubly unlikely for him to interact with. And three, she's, all, she's being asked for water. Are we, you know, the, the thing that could make him unclean would be to drink water from her. So he is breaking all of these taboos, right? To make the point that this good news is not going to keep people comfortable. It's not going to be simple or easy. It's life changing on so many levels. And then she says, who are you, a Jew, to ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And he goes on and he tells her about how he knows that she has had five husbands and that the man she's living with now is not her husband. Now, I think it's important to make a note at this point because we have opinions about people with five husbands in general, right? Uh, we tend to make, if we know someone in our day and time who has five husbands, we tend not to think as highly of them, perhaps, as we might some other people, right? Here's an important thing to understand about the Samaritan, or the ancient Near Eastern culture, and this woman in particular. Women had no authority to get a divorce. And the only way that women survived in this culture is if men provided for them, because they also couldn't own property and they couldn't go out and get a job. And so when we hear that this woman has had five husbands, what we should be hearing in an ancient Near Eastern terms is that this woman had been exploited and abused by the system that was supposed to care for her. She had been left again and again and again. And she had no recourse to care for herself. So yes, she was living with a man because she had to survive. And five men had chosen to divorce her. And so she's there in the middle of the day, probably avoiding other people from around the village. And Jesus says to her directly, and Diane made this point in Bible study and it has stayed with me since she said it. This may be the only place where Jesus says to anybody other than a demon, I am the Messiah. I am he. And he says it to a woman of Samaria who has been abused by the systems of her day and is drawing water at noontime in the heat for a Jewish rabbi. Jesus does not lead us into comfortable places. In fact, the places where we are most likely to hear the word of God speaking into our lives is not where we're comfortable, it's where we're uncomfortable, right? When we're in those places that make us unsure of ourselves or of what we're doing or what we should be doing, those are the times when our hearts become most attuned to the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives. I've been thinking a lot about the importance of being uncomfortable. And I've also been, as you have, I'm sure, just horrified by the news coming out of Flint, Michigan. And I've been thinking about how many people knew that that water was bad. How many people knew? And I don't mean this as a judgmental comment about any one person, but more as a statement about how important it is to remember that when we are in places of comfort, we have to be very careful that we are being held accountable for listening to God's nudge. I have to believe that there were some people who were uncomfortable with what was going on there. But having the courage to speak, that is a spiritual matter. And that is why it is so important to be sure that we also spend time with the kind of Christians who will help us to do the right and courageous things, who will help us with that discomfort and choose to do the right things. 
That's the power of Christian community. That's why it's so important to be in Christian community so that we can be encouraged to act on those nudges. We can say, you know, this is going on and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do something about it or not and talk about it with other Christians and pray about it to listen for what God has to say to us. I read a quote by Ken Blanchard recently that I wanna share with you. He says, there is a difference between interest and commitment. When you're interested in something, you do it when it's convenient. When you are committed to something, you accept no excuses. Think about that. When you're interested in something, you do it when it's convenient. And when you are committed to something, you accept no excuses. So I wanna ask you this morning, are you intentional about stepping into places that may feel uncomfortable knowing that that is the place where God is most likely to be heard? Are you a person who is committed to the way of Christ rather than someone who is merely interested? The Samaritan woman, when she understood what it was that Jesus was saying to her, went back to her village, and I imagine that that must not have been an easy thing to do with her history with those people. She went back to her village and she said, come and see this man who has told me everything that I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? I think that was a great act of courage on her part. And in doing so, she opened the way for those people to also spend time with Jesus. And the scripture says that they came to believe not simply because of the woman's testimony, but because of their experience of Jesus. And so this morning, maybe you are somebody who is thinking about making a commitment to Christ for the first time. And if so, I invite you to do that this morning prayerfully. Maybe you're somebody, and this is most of us, who's been committed to Christ for a long time. But does that commitment seep into every aspect of your life? Does it influence not only your church life, but also your work life, or your school life, or your family life, or whatever aspects of your life are part of how you spend your days? I've shared with you before one of my favorite images for the ways we live our lives in Christ that we think about the different segments of the pie that we have, right? The time that we spend in this place and the ways that we live out this aspect or that aspect of our lives. And rather than thinking of our Christian faith as one piece of the pie, we are invited to think of it as the pie plate, which undergirds and holds all of it together. And so I want you to reflect this day on how it is that you are committed to the kind of spiritual maturity to which we are invited. Are you interested in Jesus or are you committed to Christ? Thanks be to God, amen. I invite you to turn to page 2153 and stand in body or spirit as we sing together, I'm gonna live so God can use me.
me in an attitude of prayer, and then we will share together in our Lord's Prayer, found on page 895. O God of fire and freedom, deliver us from our bondage to what can be counted, and go with us in a new exodus toward what counts, but can be measured in bread shared and swords become plowshares, in bodies healed and minds liberated, in songs sung, in justice done, in laughter in the night and joy in the morning, in love through all seasons and great gladness of heart, in all people coming together and a kingdom coming in glory, in your name being praised and an hour becoming alleluias through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we will worship God with our tithes and our offerings. Hold on one second. Every gift needed to build up the church. You continually guide the church in every place by your spirit, the spirit of the risen Christ. During this week of prayer for Christian unity, help us to recognize each denomination as a genuine witness to the wholeness of Christ's body. In gratitude, we offer our spiritual and financial gifts to support the ministry and mission of this congregation. Through Christ we pray, amen. Amen.
about is uh, ways that in the charitable world, we tend to shy away from uh, paying for overhead type things. Um, but I want to say to you that because of your giving, you help to provide facility space, not only for our worship and our Sunday school, but also for the preschool all week long and for the clothing closet ministry throughout the week. And because of your generosity, we are able to be in mission and ministry through our Code Purple Shelter and the feeding ministries and all of those things. And I'm grateful to God for each one of you in doing that. I invite you now to turn and to share Christ's peace with one one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Sorry, confusing the poor sound person. Sorry, Marty. Sometimes my hand just turns it off and my brain doesn't even realize I've done it. I invite you now to go forth in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. And all of God's people say. Amen. Oh, David, before we sing, I forgot one important thing. <clears throat> Within the first or second quarter of this year at some point, the projectors that we have been talking about for a long time are going to become fixtures on this side of those wooden parts of the sanctuary. So some Amish carpenters are gonna build us some wood boxes to match our current wood. The projectors are gonna shoot onto that wall with no screen. And so what you will see will be probably another little strip of wood on the, the back side there. So, Hopefully all of the tradespeople who need to have that happen will come together quickly, but we don't want to make any promises we can't deliver. Now, let us join together in singing our closing hymn, number 2241. <laughs> 